Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Method Not Magic. This is part of our Value Selling Redefined series with Upland Software and Corporate Visions. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. The webinar today is being recorded and the replay and the slides will be available following the broadcast. All attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar. We do have time at the end for Q&A, so if you have any questions, use the question tool on the right-hand side of your screen. We're going to collect all those questions, answer as many of them as we possibly can at the end of the webinar. If we don't get to, them, to the questions at the end of the webinar, we will respond directly after that. So we have a great lineup of speakers today, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Patrick Morrissey, the SVP and GM at Upland Software. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks, Sean. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm excited to get into a dialogue, and we want to make this, to Sean's point, interactive, because one of the great parts about my job here at Upland is I get to spend a lot of time with senior sales and revenue leaders. And Tim and I, my partner in crime, Tim Reister from Corporate Visions, have been having a little bit of a video series that some of you have seen as a precursor to the dialogue we're going to have today, which is really talking, you know, moving from from theory into practice. And we're excited to join a, a, to have a joint customer of ours, Sarah Walker, who's a great sales leader and, and revenue leader at, at BT, talk about the transformation going on at BT. And really, you know, what does the world look like in actual practice when you've got a team of hundreds of people, you've got revenue targets of hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you know, across the entirety of the business? That's a really heavy lift. And I think there's a real opportunity in today's market where we're all trying to think about the art of the possible in reimagining selling to really deliver a new level of value to our customers. So, yeah, Tim, welcome to the program as well. Hey, thanks, Pat. Good to be here. Uh, we had a good time recording the previous videos, and I'm looking forward to a live conversation with you. Yeah, even better. So we'll do a little bit of, of the setup here and set some context for everybody, and then we're going to welcome you know Sarah into the conversation. But just a little bit by way of background here at Upland uh, in the Enterprise Sales and Marketing Cloud, we really think of ourselves as being in the business of customer revenue optimization. So that's working with folks like Sarah and her team to help them be more effective in actually actioning and delivering value for their teams. And we talk about that as customer revenue optimization. And that's really about delivering value, not just in a sales context, but every member of the team really aligning around and surrounding themselves around the customer, putting the customer of the middle. And what we're bringing is really three pieces of the puzzle, strategy, methodology, and technology. Strategy is all about how do you organize the team and your go-to-market strategy with you know, a process and a systematic approach that's gonna drive value in every interaction. And it's really oftentimes anchored and starts with an account plan. The second piece of the puzzle is methodology. And I think anybody who's in strategic selling knows the value of methodology, but in plain English, this is all about everybody speaking the same language and speaking the customer's language every day. So you can drive to the right kind of outcomes. And then finally, technology is a suite of applications we provide from account planning and opportunity management to proposal and reference management to content operations and sales process. How do we really connect the sales process to the buyer journey to deliver those outcomes? And oftentimes here at Altify, we work with organizations like Corporate Visions because we tend to think of this a little bit of this is, you know, we're the how you do things, but that turns into what are the conversations you need to have? And that's really where the intersection with corporate visions comes in. So, Tim, why don't you give us a little bit of context on corporate visions and then we'll get into it. Yeah, we like to think of our business as salespeople with their lips moving. Um, and the idea is process methodology and the technology that enables it is absolutely important to keep people on task and in a consistent way. Um, but then they have to show up, whether that's virtual like this or maybe eventually someday in person, and they have to say something smart. So we talk about articulating value in conversations that win, the crucial conversations, the acute commercial moments where salespeople's lips have to move and say something of value that helps the customer frame that value and make choices. So we really have three ways we help companies do that. Help them understand that value is situational, and we're going to talk more about that today. The idea of there's an acquisition motion and there's an expansion motion. You're, you're, you're going out to acquire business, but you're also trying to keep and grow business, and they are different. Making value specific. 
there are questions that customers answer along the buying journey and your value needs to specifically answer those questions that they're asking why change why now why you not them why pay this much why stay with you why do more with you so you have to make it very specific to the moment you're in and finally make it systematic we help uh, as we'll talk about later marketing sales and customer success teams speak with one voice so uh, the customer conversation is sort of the driving force behind all of these departments uh, engaging with uh, decision makers yeah, that's right. And I, and I think one of the things that you said that is paramount in this conversation for all of us is you talked about acute customer moments. I would argue that all of these customer moments are acute because everybody's time is stretched. Everybody has multiple competing priorities and every moment of truth with the customer has to count. So well, they're doing right. a lot online, right? They're doing so much online that when you finally do get them live, like they, they're all amped up and you better be amped up because that, that moment is the moment of truth. Um, because fewer and farther between are the conversations they have with you because they're doing so much digitally that this moment cannot suck. So let's help it unsuck. <laughs> exactly. That is that is really what we do. We we help people raise the game. So let's put those three foundational blocks together just briefly, and then we'll get Sarah involved in this conversation. The first thing, as some of you have seen in the, the video series, and I'll I'll let you start, Tim. Is you know mission number one for many organizations is you know, we need to to get on the field and we really need to have a meaningful conversation and it gets to how do you define and how do you expand value? Where does that start for you? Yeah, it's it's one of those things where in February I stood in front of an audience at one of the world's largest SaaS software vendors and 3,000 of their sales leaders and they said, hey, here's our portfolio. Most of uh, what we've sold to our customers is this much of our portfolio our year is going to be spent selling our the rest of our portfolio to mo, to our our customers which the the leader said was is going to be 80 percent of our revenue this year and so the idea of great account management great customer success and then turning that into the commercial move like renewals and upsells is what we call expanding value um that, that wasn't too brilliant because everybody talked about land and expand but I think too many companies let the expand part uh, to chance. They thought, you know what, we'll just make sure our product really works well. We'll surround them with some love, some TLC, and, and the rest is just going to take care of itself. But now everybody's starting to realize like that is its own commercial moment. And our company needs to be organized, marketing, sales, and customer success around the expansion moment. Literally talk about a second funnel very deliberately at worked on, activated, managed, and, and processed um, because it can't be accidental. It has to happen on purpose. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and that's very much aligned with the way we see the world too because the point that you hit on around sales kickoff is 100% true for everybody who's got a quota right now. Not only is it easier to sell to your existing customers, but in the COVID-based sell-in-place world that we live in, everybody's taking a much more conservative approach to the interactions that they're having and the relationships that they have, which means you've got to understand as a sales leader and as a revenue team, people problem and potential for your existing install base and really bake that into a, the account plan. Who are the people that matter? Who are the key players and who make the decisions? What problems are we uniquely selling and positioning to? And then how do I find the white space? The problem most organizations have is anybody who's been sophisticated in selling knows the value of account planning. It's all about visualizing the, the white space uh, or, you know, Brian Selby, who runs sales operations at Tableau, he talks about it as the surface area in the account. And the approach that they have taken is what they come to refer to as discover and descend. If we can discover what's most important to our clients, if we can understand who, who's responsible, who owns that, and we can craft a unique value proposition to help them solve the problems, then we're, we're on the right footing to descend into the business and catalyze new opportunities. But it starts with that moment of truth and it starts with having a plan to really understand the surface area and the potential in your existing accounts and then driving a plan cohesively across the whole business to go act on that. Yeah, it also means then that you need to know that the psychology of an existing customer and the conversation you need to have with them is different. Um, when you won the business, you were trying to disrupt and defeat status quo and dislodge the incumbent. Now you are the incumbent, you have an advantage, you're working inside, 
you've produced some results and now you're trying to leverage that into more and the story you tell and the skills with it, which you tell it, I argue you are, are different when you are in expansion mode versus when you're in acquisition mode and understanding that psychology being different, disrupt status quo bias when you wanna win new business defend status quo bias when you are the status quo bias and then build right. on it right it's it's a build on success and track record and investment and effort it shouldn't feel like when they discover and descend like it's a net new opportunity they have to have a deliberate um, sort of feel of evolution and incremental continuous value improvement and expansion versus that whole disruption like i'm here to tell you a bunch of, about a bunch of new stuff our own research has showed that if you come in with this hardcore disruption message to an existing customer you reopen the whole dialogue they're like geez if i have to change this much and consider all these new things i might as well make sure i'm doing it right and look at everybody else so make sure your expansion and the value you bring is is seen as a continuous effort on top of success as opposed to a net new effort on the side couldn't agree more. And that leads us to the second foundational piece of this conversation. Because if you've expanded value, if you've opened up opportunity or, and potential for new opportunities, if you've identified potential in the accounts, you can start to turn those into actual opportunities, which means, again, back to those acute customer moments, you've got to be armed to have a conversation and come prepared to present meaningful value. How do you think about that, Tim? Well, the thing about creating value in, in the mind's eye for someone is the way we think about it is that if you solve only the problems they precisely know they have, that doesn't create enough value either in them having urgency to change or creating enough value that they see you different from anybody else. That in fact, creating value is creating a little bit of uncertainty, helping them see needs uh, and, and problems or missed opportunities they didn't even know they had or at least showing them the ones I have and showing them the size and the speed with which they're gonna affect them. So creating value is helping create this buying vision in their mind. And we know statistically that if you can create that buying vision, they can see that extra value, they're more willing to make the decision and they're more willing to give you the business versus anyone else because you've inspired that. So again, just merely responding to the known problems with the typical capabilities you have is, is not going to distinguish you enough and it's really not going to create enough urgency. It's the unknown problem and how you solve it uniquely that really transforms the create value conversation. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's related intrinsically to do you really understand what's going on in the account and who makes the decisions? And it puts a real primacy on several different things. One is understanding, you know, relationships and navigating for influence. Can you actually see and is it part of an, an opportunity plan where you know who you're trying to get to? Because the, the problem I think a lot of us have in selling is we think we create value, but we're only talking to the people who talk to us. We're not talking to the people who make decisions and really make the measurements on value. And the related piece of that is you got to be able to articulate your value in the customer's language which means you have to understand their goals, their pressures, where they're spending money on, how they make decisions, and really be able to articulate to them, not just that bigger vision of, of the value and the art of the possible, but do it against their goals, their measuring stick, their language, their metrics. And so you behave as a trusted advisor and an extension of the team. Because you know, value's in the eye of the beholder, right? And it's all about, do you understand and you're, are you speaking the customer's language? Yeah, I, we, we wrote a book called The Three Value Conversations, so I'll sneak one more in here. When you create value, you might, have, you might have to elevate that value because 80 plus percent of B2B decisions are being made by business and financial decision makers who don't day to day use the stuff you're selling. And so they, they measure this on a whole different plane. And we've now and again looked inside of people's CRM systems and tools like Altify and said, how many VP or higher level titles do you have associated with this account? And I don't want to embarrass any company we've worked with, but the percentage is much lower than 80%. So if 80% of deals require a VP or level higher sign off, you should be seeing 80% of those deals having VP uh, contacts in them that you are actively working. Um, so uh, you being able to articulate value in a way that's meaningful to that audience is, is imperative. 
Exactly. And that really brings us to the third piece of the conversation, which is how do you orchestrate that conversation and how do you speak in one voice? Because the, the challenge oftentimes is when the rubber hits the road is in spite of best intentions, the cycles that are going on in your multiple outbound channels and sales assets and marketing assets, um, if you're lucky, they, they generally align with what the sales team and the revenue team is talking about, but oftentimes they're wildly disconnected. Um, so that's one part of the problem. And another part of the problem, I think, is really the strategic use of some of your most important assets to to really drive the, the conversation, whether it's what's the role of, of an RFP or a proposal in context of the sales process to actually the diagnostic on the sales process itself. Are we helping the customer move through the buying journey? And then, you know, finally, there's also the the keys of the castle for a lot of these conversations are also who are the references who are the other people we can bring to validate the vision and the the opportunity that we're helping to present and are do all those messages align that's a really challenging thing particularly when you think about the world of sophisticated b2b selling where you've got you know tens or more people involved in the decision process you've now got many more people involved in the buying committee and you've got a lot of different channels and fundamentally you just have really smart customers yeah, I think that one of the things when you look at this, and, and I talked about how we help salespeople with their lips moving, well, that's one part skill. You have to have skill to create value and expand value and elevate value. You need that skill, but you need the story to back that up. And organizationally, the idea of one voice is making sure that when you hit a moment or hit a mark in your sales process, that the salesperson has all the tools and all the knowledge that you guys provide, but then also has the story to go with the skills needed. And so we we believe marketing, and our guest later is gonna talk about this, needs to be intricately involved to make sure the story and the skills line up to the moment that is being addressed in the process. And that um, that even uh, uh, compounded then when customer success shows up in the, in the expand value area, where now marketing is building stories for acquisition and expansion. Sales is learning to pivot between acquisition and expansion and they're learning how to work with another organization in that uh, customer success account management program. So one voice is about sealing these three groups into singular customer conversation focus, and I think process methodology, and then message story skills make that happen. Yeah, and the, and the last piece I'll add on is, I think there's also a reality check about the answer to all problems is not more content. We did our own you know, research in our content benchmark, and, and what comes back out of that is you know, up to 65% of the content an organization produces, whether it's the customer-facing pieces or it's the internal pieces for the, for the sales and, and the marketing teams, are useless as judged by the customer. It's just wasted effort. So one voice is all about understanding the value as defined by the customer and what do they need to execute on that journey? More is not more. And that that puts, to your point a second ago, Tim, real, real importance and criticality on really bridging that sales, marketing, customer success, as not as silos in the organization, but again, putting the customer in the middle of it and bringing the process methodology and approach together. Yeah, absolutely. Would agree that most content, the reason it's useless is is not aligned to where you are in the moment. And so you're just flooding them with sort of above the funnel type content as opposed to focus content on what you're trying to accomplish. And uh, so I, I beg marketers and sales enablement teams to really look at their methodology for acquisition and for expansion and align content to those conversations that they're actually going to have so that you're advancing that decision, not overwhelming uh, the comprehension, I guess. Exactly, and let's, that's a good place to, to jump off because I think we could talk, you and I have already talked in several videos about you know, the, the art and the science and the, and the art of the possible here, but I, I think we'll, let's bring in somebody who actually owns the problem and is sitting on top of the problem and, and get some perspective on, on how she thinks about this. Tim and I are pleased to welcome Sarah Walker, who's the Director of Corporate and Public Sector for British Telecom, or BT for short, as, as many of you know. Sarah, good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon. There's lots of stuff we want to get into and lots of dialogue as well as I would remind the audience. We want to hear from you as well. So Tim and I are going to start to foster a conversation with Sarah and, and get some of the, the background. We invite you to drop your questions in the in the chat box and we want to get to them as Sean talked about, 
you know, here in short order, but we want to get a little bit of the, the basics uh, put together first. So as I mentioned at the top of the program, Sarah, you know, you're a sales leader, you've got big targets and big teams. Before we get into, you know, what you're up to, give us a little bit of background on you, both your role and, and what you've done prior that, that brings us to today. Certainly. So, um, and first of all, Pat and Tim, thank you very much for, for welcoming me to this call. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be part of such a great series and a, a great debate already. So I'm looking forward to exploring those themes uh, a bit more as the call progresses. Um, so I've, I've had the opportunity to work in sales and sales leadership now for 23 years. Um, and I've enjoyed every single one of those 23 years in BT. Um, so I've worked from the bottom up. I started in, uh, I guess, what people would now call inside sales, but good old desk-based account management uh, back in the late 1990s. And I've worked my way through various different roles in sales and sales leadership um, across BT, um, all in a B2B basis as well. So I've lived and breathed the, the salesperson's challenge and I've lived and breathed the leadership challenge as well. And hopefully today what I'll be able to do is, is give some context to how we've taken all of that learning and the evolution that we've seen in BT over recent years, along with the partnerships with, with Upland and, and Corporate Visions and how we're using some of that now to transform the business that we are today. Um, so I think, Pat, I'm going to start with just giving a bit of context to BT Group. Please. Um, although we are a UK brand, very much a global organisation, um, and our group context is, is quite considerable. So on an annualised basis, we, we return revenues of over £22 billion from our customer-facing units. Um, globally, we support around 800 multinationals, and we reach 28 million consumer customers within the UK. So our, our breadth and our customer base is considerable. And um, the role that I have within corporate and public sector resides in our enterprise unit. And the enterprise unit is effectively the B2B unit within the UK. And we support over a million organizations through enterprise, right from our SMEs through to our wholesale and, and major organizations. So quite a diverse and complex business that we run. Corporate and public sector as a part of that um, actually generates around about 10% of the profit at a group level. So corporate and public sector is a key contributor to, uh, to BT's overall revenues and profits. And it's a really interesting part of, of BT as a group because as I say, this is where we focus all of our B2B efforts within the UK. And the dynamics of that patch then, as I say, cover everything from our, our small and medium enterprises through to central government, our MOD, local government and public sector and some of the biggest UK brands. So with that, as you can imagine, there is a huge diversity and complexity to our portfolio. Um, there's a lot of demand on our sales teams and our propositions teams uh, to really deeply and richly understand that market and understand how BT best supports customers um, within the UK. And as part of our transformation, there's, there's two things that we've focused on. Uh, one is how we get closer to our customers. So we've developed a regional strategy now that allows us to really you know, enhance our understanding of the local economies, the nuances that exist um, within the regional structures that we have across the UK. Um, but then also to reflect um, the, the buying behaviours of, of customers in the UK, which has changed considerably over the last, even the last five years actually. And when we talk about the buying behaviours in, in the context of telco or technology, it's we've seen a huge shift from very product oriented technology driven sales to customers really looking to organizations like BT to understand how technology becomes an enabler for business strategy um, and, and business outcomes. And that is a huge shift both in terms of the ask that customers have of us, but equally in turn how we need to sell and how we need to face off to our customers to be compelling in that space. So it's been a considerable transformation both structurally but also in terms of the way we coach and enable our sales teams and obviously Upland and, and Corporate Vision become critical partners um, in that transformation, which is what we're going to, uh, to elaborate on a little further this afternoon. Exactly. And, and I want to um, circle back to a point that you made because I don't want it to get lost. The, the scale of transformation you're talking about is is really global, right? It is no small thing. If you think about the, your career in the last 20 years, you know, tell me what's different. Give us a little context of that transformation because it's a big jump to go from being the being a leader globally in, as a telecommunications firm to thinking about being a technology solutions provider. 
What's that look like at BT? Absolutely. Well, and where do I start, Pat? I mean, when I started in BT, um, it, it's fair to say the portfolio was was very small and targeted. It, it was core to BT, and we very much had a monopoly. So the competitive landscape, when I started in BT, we had two or three competitors across a very small part of our portfolio. Um, if you look at that context globally now, the amount of disruption, um, disruptors and, and competitors we have globally, I couldn't you know, begin to imagine how, how many people we're competing with on a daily basis. My first job in BT, ironically, was selling analog mobiles and trying to convince small and medium enterprises that mobile was the future and that having this, this mobile handheld device would be in some way transformational for their organization. We roll forward to where we are today and my team are talking about pervasive 5G technology and you know how that becomes a, a critical enabler not just for businesses but for regions and for nations so you know that the technology landscape has shifted considerably the competitive landscape has shifted considerably and the role that technology plays in our everyday life um, yeah i think covid has, has kind of amplified that more so than ever the power of connection you know connectivity and the significance of digital mobility um, is more important now than it's ever been so that creates um, a huge opportunity um, and equally some challenges for, for BT now. One hundred percent. So I'll ask this question, then I'll let Tim ask a, you know the next question. But th give me some context then, as you think about your business, because you've got a big team, you've got hundreds of people on the team, you, you've got you know hundreds of millions of, of pounds to deliver. What do you give me some context about the role of account planning as you? you try to think about your resources and your go-to-market model and what's your plan, you know, as, as sales teams, we always talk about what's the plan to make plan. How do you think about, you know, account planning and the role that that plays back to this digital intersection to, to help drive the teams to be successful? Sure. So uh, to give you some context, um, Pat, the, the business that I run within corporate and public sector delivers revenues around 600 million annually um, and around 280 million profit. So it's a, a consi considerable portion of, of the overall CPS um, business. And we support everything from customers with 100 employees up to the largest brands and also the local government um, and public sector customers across the region. So the first thing that we need to understand is the markets in which we're operating, the sectors that we're supporting, and what appropriate planning looks like in that, because obviously the scale at which we would plan for our major customers is far more significant than, than the approach that we would take for our, for our smaller customers, but the impact of effective planning you know, it isn't, doesn't uh, diminish at all in, in those different sectors. So the first thing is, is understanding the market context and how we align that into a planning process. Um, the second and, and picking up that Tim um, alluded to is understanding our objectives for the customer. So are they customers that we don't particularly trade with on any scale at the moment and we would arguably be looking at an acquisition play versus those that we have a considerable amount of their wallet opportunity already and we're looking at, at how we expand into, into new revenue streams. And interestingly, one of the decisions that was made um, on that in, in complete recognition of corporate vision's observations as well is that they are very different resources for us. They are very different skill sets. And we've split out actually that role within our organization so that we have, I guess, the, the old fashioned hunter farmer type individuals focused on very different types of planning in recognition of the different sales approaches that, that are required. So with that as the context, you know, that, that's the important bit that we need as a foundation to understand how and where we align our resources and the approach that we would take to, to account planning. Um, you've alluded to white space, landscaping, um, that, that type of activity is, is hugely important at whatever stage you're at with a customer. So even those that we enjoy a considerable wallet share, that refreshing and challenging yourself continuously on, on what the rest of that wallet opportunity is, is, is really, really important. And the structure. So obviously we work with yourself at Upland in terms of our account development plan and um, structure. And I think that rigor um, and consistency is hugely, hugely important and bringing all of the team into, into that process. Um, and, you know, when we look at that um, account planning, it isn't with a, here's the products that we have, how we put that into an account plan. It has to be customer first. So it's looking at the customer's business, their business strategy, 
their objectives over you know a two to three year horizon and investing the time to understand the customer lens before we then start to plan from our perspective where we think we can add value into that client base or where we can create value um, and one of the things tim that we've discussed that is most powerful where do we think the unconsidered need is based on what we've learned from this customer that we then start to create some compelling opportunity plans and some really you know valuable messages to take back into the client around the role that we as bt and the technology that we have plays in enabling their their business yeah i i gotta believe that everybody listening is is sort of feeling the journey that you've been on right the simple products that you could learn and you could you could promote now to a, a whole lot of products and a whole different customer centric discussion so from company product to customer outcomes is the journey that a lot of companies are on but it's a complex one so all of a sudden there's so much complexity the thing that i've been most um uh impressed by the work that you've done is recognizing that the poor seller can't just go to a singular training event and try to learn it and then remember it when they need it they're in these situations where they need to be flexible and the marriage of yes teaching them the, the skills and giving them the right story and giving them a methodology and a process to follow but then literally enabling that and integrating that so that if they are stage one new opportunity the right things present themselves or if they are stage two existing customer let's do a business review the right things present themselves this idea of i i i call it situational enablement uh just in time as opposed to just in case <laughs> uh i've been totally impressed at how you've knit that all together so maybe talk us through that understanding and and where you guys have gotten to and where you see it going Absolutely, and and you're completely right, Tim. If I wind back even, you know, maybe five to seven years ago, our enablement for our sales teams was very much around the technical features and benefits of our products. And if they knew that, they could sell, right? And and it was far far more simple and, and transactional. And um, but but we wind back now to um, that that process end to end. And one of the things that we've done um, across the kind of ecosystem that we have, I would say, marries the science and, and the art of selling is bring together the, the Altify account planning tool that we have um, by Rockland and actually integrate um, the work that we've done on winning conversations all via Salesforce and our, our CRM. So as you say, from a process perspective, um, the account planning or the opportunity planning tool will take you to a point where you've identified what the gap is in, in that opportunity or that account plan. But actually then where do you go to the insight to say, based on that knowledge that you now have, what conversation do you need to create or what piece of research do you need to do? So the, the real step change for us was integrating then the resources and the tools from winning conversations into the hyperlinks actually within Salesforce and Altify to say, actually you know having gone through this opportunity it looks like we haven't really qualified why the customer would want, want to change you know what's the compelling reason that this customer will will change provider and and make this a, a viable opportunity so we we take that straight out into the why change content and then we can brainstorm that live in that opportunity review and that's been really valuable and i know we talked about this that sales people need those resources in a single place as soon as you're you know you're you're harnessing that in, in four or five different share points or whatever it may be that that will uh, that will diminish the returns that you have in terms of sales sales people going and, and looking for those resources so that in the moment let's click through let's really challenge ourselves on why this customer might change and those three things the why questions have been really valuable for us in the moment so why change why now and why you and um, are really critical points in qualification for us both in terms of opportunities that we qualify out as well as those that we then progress and carry on with a you know a far more uh, rich opportunity plan so that they're really really pivotal for us and uh, in the absence of having had them fully integrated into the tools we, we weren't quite as effective as we needed to be in terms of our you know support and coaching of our sales teams yeah i'll just say as humans we can only consume so much so we want to learn it in the moment we need it right so i always joke that salespeople, but truly all humans are deficit learners we learn best when we find ourselves in a deficit and i might have to make 
six calls today and then some I'm in stage two, some I'm in stage three, some are over here, some are over there. I wanna get smart and prep and plan for that moment and have everything I need for that moment right there available to me in that moment. And that used to be just a dream, but you guys are making it a reality. So it is impressive and something that I think a lot of people can learn from. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we had both teams in the room to kind of test that. So we, you know, we had the great support from from your colleagues from both Uplands and, and Corporate Visions to go through the process so that there was that mutual understanding of how we use the testing and improve process on an opportunity and actually where the synergies are that the were then in, in the winning conversations. And you know, the power of those partnerships coming together is is really, really important. I don't think it's something that a sales leader can do independently of the of the support of the partners. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. I know Tim does as well, and we're we're appreciative of your time. A reminder to the audience, we're gonna open this up to some audience questions here in a second. But before we a couple more things just to hit on briefly before we get there. And I want to go back to the the point that you hit on Sarah and then Tim you know touched on too is the element of coaching and one of the things he said earlier that that captures my attention. Every time I talk to Tim, I get a new soundbite or something else that that captures my attention. But he talked about acute customer moments, and mm -hmm. you know, arguably, particularly in in the COVID-based reality we're s selling into, almost all the moments are acute, and I think that puts a primacy on the need and and the importance of coaching and to be able to bring bring that capability and bring the resource and bring the uh, just bring the help sometimes or the I hear you to your sales leaders and, and their teams. What's what's top of mind for you as you think about trying to navigate your team through a, a difficult time and, and difficult market conditions and, and get to those moments that matter in terms of the coaching element here? Yeah, so, you know, interestingly, I've got over over 400 staff, 130 of whom would ordinarily be working in an office, can't we be sat next to each other and, and that coaching opportunity, right. you know, far easier when, when you're sat next to a colleague and, and you can see real time. So it, it's definitely created a different lens on our leadership team on how you still manage that in the moment coaching. Um, but I think one of the things, and I, I'll probably touch on this at the end as, as the foundations, is you've got to instill the confidence in your team to be very honest and open um, and, and converse with you very regularly about their sales opportunities and, uh, you know, be, be open to the coaching first and foremost, because the biggest challenge as a leader is deciphering what your sales teams are telling you and understanding you know how real that is and, and how much you need to delve into so you've got to have that culture of honesty first and foremost um and the state but not getting swept away with this and, and tim you articulate it the needs where we're, we're very very guilty of it in bt this is the technical requirement the customer has this is the product that fits the technical requirements so let's get swept away with the sale because we know that we you know in a very commoditized way we fit the bill and the role of our leadership team in that coaching is, is just continuing to challenge that. So, you know, we will be one of 10, 20 vendors that have that same technical capability. Explain to me why we're different. Explain to me what will compel the customer to change. Explain to me why this isn't going to be a race to the bottom in, in terms of cost. And it's, you know, our, our leaders and our, our sales managers and our coaches doing that repetitively in every sales opportunity so that we don't allow ourselves to get swept away in that commodity sale and then find out at the end of the process that we've we've lost on price on something that arguably we either should have qualified out or we should have taken a different route very early on and um, but that can only happen through continual regular dialogue about opportunities and that honesty and transparency and being open to to challenge and, and coaching um on, on the strategies and plans that we have in place 100 percent and as we open it up to the the floor for questions the one thing we would be remiss not to say ask you specifically sarah is we all know in the world of revenue that results are measured by your bookings number right there's a you know there's a dollars and cents component of this but zooming out for a second you and the team at bt are going through a massive transformation and you're also bringing in new coaching new process new capabilities new ways to empower and enable your teams. How do you think about measurement as you're going through this cycle and through this this transformation? What are, And what are you looking for in terms of, you know, measuring success and measuring improvement across the team beyond just the, did we hit the number? 
indeed and, and that's the balance isn't it kind of holding your nerve on on the seeds that you sow today what the long-term benefit of that is versus chasing the number on a, on a daily basis so there's, there's a few kind of kpi measures that that we think are really important um, one is the quality of pipeline first and foremost so um i guess as a, as a sales leader not getting caught up in the vanity of a of a huge pipeline that isn't particularly well qualified and being comfortable with a with a smaller pipeline and, and a higher conversion ratio so they're the things that, that we we monitor in terms of a pipeline and opportunity um tim you alluded to it portfolio coverage so how far are we pushing ourselves out the comfort zone of our of our core portfolio um, where we sell, you know, probably 20% of our portfolio to, to 80% of our customers. How do we how do we manage that blend and know that we're moving in the in the correct uh, direction in terms of those adjacent and, and new core areas? Um, and one of the um, one of the key metrics for our business, um, Pat, that if if we do this properly, is NPS. So you know, how are customers responding? to the way we support them um, and that was that was the biggest measure in the in the role that i did prior to, to the corporate and public sector role within our major corporate business which is where i started the journey um, with, with both of your organizations in that we knew it would be a, a slow a slow burner in terms of the revenue and, and the trading improvements but if we showed up in a different way and presented ourselves in a different way to our customers we would see that through our mts and actually, we moved the dials there from from negative 55. Uh, for those familiar with MPS score, that's that's market leading in the wrong direction. Um, and we exited after two and a half years at plus 44. And that was all around oh, wow. the credibility of the sales teams. It was around the innovation that we demonstrated to our customers and the way in which we took a customer first approach to understanding their business rather than the scattergun of. I have this suite of products. What would you like to buy from me today? So that that for me was the really key measure that showed that we had, you know, made the right journey with our sales teams and we were on the right trajectory for our customers, you know, reflecting their perception of us in a very different and very positive way. Well, I'll just jump in here for a second. I remember when we first met and 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 the goal was let's show up differently, let's sound different, add more value other than a traditional telecom conversation. And um, uh, <laughs> you guys were always so willing to share that number, that minus number there. And so I'm impressed you're, I guess we're on the other side of it now. So it was easier to share, but I, I think you were in good company, probably most telecom vendors, that's what it felt like to most buyers of it. So you're now, I gotta believe, not just turning the corner on not sounding like a telecom provider, you gotta believe you're differentiating yourself from other telecom providers who aren't making this pivot. Do you feel that's happening for you guys? Absolutely, and, and rest assured Tim, I didn't feel anywhere near as comfortable in sharing that number before uh, before we've made the progress and moved the dial. But again, you know, I think it comes back to that culture of, of honesty and acceptance of where you are and being clear on the things that you need to do and change to improve. You know, customer feedback is the most valuable asset that you have. Um, and if you don't respond to that and you don't change in, in response to what your customers are asking for, your portfolio, you know, is almost a moot point. You, you need to respond to that feedback. So it was actually a really great starting point and benchmark for us and has been critical in, in the choices that we've made around, let's say, the types of resources that we choose to deploy, the way in which we enable our teams and, and fundamentally the types of conversations that we ask our salespeople to have. That's extraordinary. I think that the numbers speak for themselves, and that's a, a dramatic turnaround over two years. But I got to believe there's lots of times, to your point earlier, Sarah, where you, you know, the team had to hold their nerve, and you had to have belief that you know the investment was going to be you know worth the outcome, and and that's exciting. And I think that's a great jumping off point. So I want to welcome Sean back into the conversation. Sean, let's get the audience involved. And again, reminder: people can can throw things into the chat, ask a question, and, and Sean's going to help moderate it. But you know, over to you, Sean. Yeah, so we had a comment here just saying, Sarah, your overview of BT's transformation was great. The question that follows that is, knowing more about the partnership between marketing and your team, have you any tips on driving success between the intersection of sales and marketing? 
Absolutely, and I think we have got some pointers actually that, that I would say are the are the, the foundations of success, and and that single voice or the one voice that, that Pat and Tim have alluded to is absolutely critical in that. So being candid when we started the journey, uh, we approached this as something that sales needed to go through, and we equipped our sales team to have these different conversations and to be market and customer oriented rather than product oriented. Um, but actually, we, we almost had conflicting messages then reaching the market because our, our marketing was still very product and technical features and benefits oriented. So um, we, we are now putting our marketing team through exactly the same training. Um, our new product launches go through winning conversations so that we are, we are marketing everything that we do um, in, in the same language, the same tone of voice that our, that our sales teams are conversing in. And the really interesting thing is that we use that methodology to then test the, the relevance and the, the purposefulness of, of the products that we are taking to market. And it helps us challenge our own thinking on how impactful we think some of the launches will be um, and the sectors and the markets that we think will benefit from, from the products rather than, again, you know, any, any traditional telco would be, we invariably had one size fits all. We, we've moved considerably from that. And marketing being part of this process is, is critical to make sure that uh, you are speaking in that one voice and customers see a very harmonious view of, of what you're doing end to end. I think one of the questions that's here as well and it follows on from that is moving from a product to a solution sale what differences are you seeing in the buying committee or the people that you need to impress in order to close a deal? Um, so again you know looking at products and sort of uh, transactional or tactical sales, we, we very much doubt at an operational level and um, very much focused around IT procurement or finance. And um, it may have been signed off ultimately by, by somebody at a more senior level, but never, never were the conversations particularly had at the C-suite. Um, for the, the types of sales that, that we are doing today and, and the solutions that, that we're delivering to our customers, the inception of that opportunity happens at the board level. So that sponsorship has to come from the top down because you say you're not fulfilling a functional requirement at an operational level. You're aligning yourself to what the business requirements are, understanding the business strategy. And you know what? Sometimes there isn't a, te a technology play in there, but as you understand the strategy, you can, we can start to um, enable our customers to understand the role that technology has to play in creating better efficiencies, automation, all of those great things um, that underpin their strategy, but they hadn't realized technology was the answer. You never get to that point in starting at the bottom and working your way up. So the conversation has to start at the sea level. So part of our enablement for our sales team has to be empowering them to feel confident to start that conversation at a board level. Um, again, we've probably been quite guilty historically of, of expecting that it, it must be a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Um, and, you know, with the best will in the world, a, a director can't have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with every customer. I support 10,000 customers. That would be uh, an awful lot of introductory calls. So enabling your sales team to have the confidence to go straight in at the board level um, and, and have a very good, valuable, business-oriented conversation that gives them the right to, to play, to hunt, um, you know, in, in the rest of the, the business is critical. I think that lines up as well to what Pat said earlier around the discover and descend tableau model. It seems exactly the same. One more follow-up question here as well, which is, how do you review deals in your team? So um, I'll, I'll do a bit of PR for the Altify uh, process here. So we, we go through the Altify test and improve process. That's the structure um, that we deploy for, for all opportunities. Um, but I'd say what, what we have done then is integrated the winning conversations into those um, account, into that account planning tool. So we kind of bring the best of both worlds together from a process perspective. Altify gives us the, the structure and the framework to ensure that we're following you know, a really robust structure and process to the sale. But interjecting that then with the, the learning and the resources from winning conversations means that we can we can delve off through that test and improve into some of the more valuable um, pieces of work that, that we need to do through winning conversations to make that a, a richer end-to-end -end review. 
And a final question, which is, how long have you been working with both companies, both Upland Software and Corporate Visions? I guess that ties into the overall transformation piece and the NPS boost you referenced earlier. Indeed. So um, we started, um, Gentry, you'll keep me honest if, I, if I'm off here, I think we started our journey with, with Altify actually probably about six years ago within our corporate business. And um, the Corporate Visions team joined us I think about three years ago when we when we first started the transformation and we went to market um, for a, a partner that could really help us enrich the, the conversations and help on that transformation from transactional product oriented salespeople to customer focused and solutions oriented people. So six with Altify and about three with, with Corporate Visions. I think it's probably over the last 12 months that we've brought both parties together in, the, in that ecosystem to work with us collaboratively, develop our CRM to make sure that we get best with both parties. That's all the questions from the floor. Pat or Tim, any final comments for you before we hand it back to Sarah to talk about the foundations for success? Yeah, I have one, I have one quick uh, question for you, Sarah, and then I'll, I'll come back to Tim. Is Talk to me about, as you've gone through this transformation, and you've enabled the team with process and with methodology and with account planning, with you know how to have the conversations and in coaching. How do you think about um, really growing talent? And how do these pieces come together to help you grow talent? Because at the end of the day, much as you were talking about the transformation from products to solutions, we're still all in a people business. And we've still got to have you know the great people who can articulate in those moments that matter and can and actually execute and, and build those relationships and, and have those dialogues. What's critically important to you from a sales leadership perspective in terms of, of really the, the talent part of the equation? Okay, so I guess there's a couple of things on that for me. Um, Pat, and I said as, a, as the first thing, it's the self-awareness within the individuals on where their skill sets really lie. And we found that splitting out the role of, we call it business development or acquisition from relationship management and account management really freed up people to focus on their core skills because there are very few that can actually switch between the two very competently if, if you mm. want to be truly successful in acquisition and business development they are very very different skill sets so having some really honest conversations up front with individuals around what they feel their natural skill set is and creating a resource framework that allows them to flourish with that rather than roles that potentially compromise the, the best of what they can do. And um, the second, as I say, is that empowerment piece. So, you know, that kind of historical hierarchy um, that many organizations would take where if there's a board level discussion to be had, it needs to be met with a peer within within our own organization. The more exposure our salespeople get to uh, senior leaders within their client base, the more confidence they get in having those discussions and the more maturity they then develop around their business acumen, their market awareness and their customer awareness, that naturally starts to create you know, a better intrigue by that individual to improve and, and continue to grow in the role. And I think our role as leaders is being very comfortable in offering the coaching and the support, but not the doing. And um, again, sales is, uh, you know, well known historically for as soon as you see the salesperson failing, your instinct is to jump in and take over the sale for them. You have to create right. that environment where you are always, always on hand to coach and support and guide. But you make that indiv individual feel completely empowered um, to ultimately own that sale and conversations that, that need to be had. And you know, I'm, I'm a a personal example of that, having started um, as a, as a death-based salesperson and worked my way through to, to director level within the same organisation, you know, with, with the right support and the right framework, you have some sellers on, on the front line today that will be the directors of the future with that right level of support. Couldn't, could not agree with you more. And I think that that also lends to the role of empathy, which is a whole nother webinar and just really understanding. And all of us who've, who've carried quotas and carry a bag, I got a lot of empathy for everybody who's in those roles and particularly those first line, second line sales leaders. It's, it's challenging and in that coaching environment is critical. So I'll hold that thought. I'll come back to you, Tim, as, you, as we're, you know, looking to wrap up before the top of the hour, when you think about, you know, reimagining the art of the possible and value selling and turning, you know, taking the, the magic and the, the excitement of sales and turning it into more of a science and a repeatable approach and really nailing those moments that matter. What's what's top of mind for you and what what are the key takeaways you'd leave the audience with about where they should focus to really drive impact right now? 
Well, first, I'd love to thank Sarah for being so honest about where they started and, and how far they've come. When we met, your claim to fame was we were the first company to lay a transatlantic cable using wooden ships, right? I think. And, and uh, you know, that was, if, if this can, if this transformation can happen in telecom, I think it's, it, it's, I don't mean to, to denigrate the industry. I think it was pretty basic stuff. And to make this significant transformation is impressive. And I'll guess I'll end by asking yeah. Sarah this question is, Sometimes when we want to make this transformation, and Pat alluded to talent, we just want to switch out the talent and, and bring in the people who can be the consultants as opposed to try and help our people make this pivot. And this is the thing. You went from an old line telecom company to a transformational business strategy, technology enablement company. I, I assume that the majority of the people making that pivot have been there through this. You didn't just go out and swap out sales forces. Absolutely. You know, there's... Uh... There's a number of, of people like myself that we probably refer to as lifers that have got you know significant tenure um, in in either the industry or the or the company, and I think there's you know a, a great richness in um, the knowledge that you acquire over that period of time. You should never underestimate the value of of your of your front line and your sales teams in offering you that that insight. And um, I think as long as you create the right environment and, and the right culture that is progressive and open to change you, you don't need to be changing out yourself source with any degree of regularity and you should really really invest on bringing the best out of the, the people that you have yeah awesome great work yeah absolutely and that that's a good bridge too i think the wrap-up sarah you you've got a sophisticated business you got a big team you got a big number what what guidance or you know how do you give us some context for this framework to talk through for everybody else who's going through this transformation which to tim's point i think is is not just comms, it's everybody. Everybody's moving to a subscription-based world. Everybody's trying to move from, from products to value and longer-term relationships. Give us your takeaways in terms of how to think about this journey and what's critical to success. Well, and I guess there's a few of these that I'll, I'll delve into a little deeper, Patrick, in the, in the interest of time. But I've, I've talked about it a few times, but you cannot underestimate the significance of culture as the first pillar to foundation. And, and when I talk about the culture, I mean, this has to be um, a sales force that is market and customer oriented, probably more so than it is focused on your own products and portfolio. Because in the absence of understanding the market and the customer context, it is very, very difficult to translate what you do to your customers. So you want a, a culture where people are naturally inquisitive around the customers and the markets that they, they operate within and that they want to invest time to understand that and that forms part of their professional and business development and they they are you know more rounded and and take responsibility to be so with that then leads into the customer first is that again you know, don't fall into the trap of thinking about your own sales process and the things that you need out of the sales process and from your customers because actually their buying processes may not align to that at all so you need to put yourself in in the shoes of the customer first and foremost understand their uh, their buying processes their motivations um, and and ensure that the way you are trying to sell to them aligns to that we touched on the engagement strategy but but board level c-suite um, engagement across multiple functions is more important now than ever i'd say we've we've very much moved from these being procurement it or finance discussions you know we, we see marketing we see CISOs being more and more critical to the strategic decisions that are made across organizations and your engagement strategy should be multifaceted both in terms of depth across the organization but also the, the market units within your within your customer base that, that you're you're facing off to and we talked about the single voice that was one of the questions that came through and um, and the last thing that i would lead on is, is qualification um, and and with this i mean also the, the the confidence to qualify opportunities out early um, the, the biggest challenge we have in, in sales with finite resources is that we continue to chase the wrong opportunities and we, you know, we, we expend valuable resource, um, time, cost and energy on an opportunity that, that we never should have pursued. But you have to create an environment where your salespeople and, and your managers and your coaches are comfortable to say, this is not an opportunity that we should pursue, this is why. And this is why I'm going to move on to something else that, that's more viable for us and for our customers. But equally to challenge the customer in some instances then on these are the observations that we've made that say why we wouldn't want to pursue this opportunity. 
are you aware that these are, are some of the things that might actually you know deter a, a partner like BT wanting to do this piece of business with you can we have a, a richer conversation around your motivations for this and what you're trying to achieve um, but I think you know again that probably lends itself back to the culture a little bit Patrick in that there's a, a whole confidence around that in the ability to qualify well and be comfortable with whether that means you're pursuing the opportunity with a really solid plan or whether you're you're stepping back from that opportunity because you don't believe it's the right thing to pursue. Couldn't agree with you more and we could have a whole different webinar just on qualification and go really deep there but uh, unfortunately, we, do, we don't have the time. I would like to say once again, sir, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your expertise, your insight, your background, and, and really the, the transformation that you and the team are going through at BT. I think that's, that's top of mind for everybody, and we're appreciative of our relationship and, and investment in time with you. Tim, thanks for being my partner in crime in this series and trying to share some of these best practices. If you'd like more information from either Tim or myself, you can find us on LinkedIn. Um, certainly, uh, Sarah's got a whole team. If you need some help with next generation solutions, um, she and team are happy to, to work with you. And you can you know, find us at corporatevisions.com and at, at uh, upland.com slash Altify. And, and Sean, anything else we need to do to take us home? No, just to re-highlight again, the uplandsoftware.com forward slash method not magic is the landing page for the three-part video series. All registrants are going to receive a copy of the method not magic ebook, which has been created. And the recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow on that microsite. So check it out there. Fantastic. Thank you once again, Tim. Thanks for the time and the expertise. Expertise. Sarah, thank you so much for investing your time. I know you've got to get back to selling and generating value for your customers. So we appreciate you taking the time. And, and Sean, thanks for, for driving us to a, a con successful conclusion. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week and good luck in delivering value. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.